かな。はい、そうや。It's like, hi, Eduardo. <laughs> Hello. I just can't get a picture in it. So I'm going to log off and log back in, see if it works. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Hello. All right. Looks like some people are coming. That's great. Um, Hey, well, I just want to let everyone know while we're waiting um, that we're going to give folks a few minutes to sign and we're going to give folks a few minutes to sign in. If you could, if you're familiar with Zoom and know how to use the tools, um, you might try um, answer a question or two for us. One is in the chat place, if you would like to make a guess as to what the median rent for a two bedroom apartment in Santa Cruz County is. Um, put that in the put that in the chat. All right. Some good guesses coming in. All right. And after that, um, um, just because I want to acknowledge, and I will some more in a minute, um, look out for being our uh, co-host with this. Um, if you're a subscriber to look out, just use the hand raising tool where it says reactions. Um, just raise your hand if you're a subscriber to look out. All right. All right, got some hands coming up. Oh, look, even Ken Doctor is a is a subscriber to look out. I'm so glad to see that. Um, so um, just another minute or two. So um, now, if you now lower your hands if you raised them. Um, and in the next, the next question for the chat is just tell us where you live. You know, if you live in the city of Santa Cruz, in Watsonville, in Boulder Creek, Live Oak, you know, what part of Santa Cruz do you live in? Just so we can get an idea of who's with us today. All right, welcome people from all over the place. That's great. I appreciate it very much. And we're going to start in about 30 seconds, but I'm going to give you the answer <laughs> as you continue to enter the community. Um, there's a few different sources for this, but the source that I checked um, said that the median rent for a two bedroom apartment in our county is just over $3,300 per month, which important to think about this also, that that means it's $40,000 a year. People need to spend $40,000 a year just for their rent, not considering all the other costs they have of living in our community. So it's a daunting situation. Um, and we're going to talk about it. So here we go. Um, I'm so glad you're with us. My name is Don Lane, and I'm on the governing board of Housing Santa Cruz County. And I'm joined um, also tonight by Chris Neely, who's the politics and policy reporter from Lookout Santa Cruz. Glad to have Chris with us. He's going to be participating in the, the questions a little later. And I just want to welcome you to this Affordable Housing Month program on the housing squeeze in Santa Cruz County, which is going to feature, as you know, elected leaders from our county government and our four local cities. The event was put together by Housing Santa Cruz County, which is a local affordable housing education and advocacy organization, and by Lookout Santa Cruz, our county's largest online news source. I want to offer a big thanks to Lookout for their work in promoting and presenting this event. And, but before we, we dive in, I also want to acknowledge the other sponsors of Affordable Housing Month, 
and thank them for their not only for their support of this this work, but their commitment to advancing housing in our community. Um, and here is here are some of the many groups: Housing for Health Partnership of Santa Cruz, Salud para la Gente, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, Ecology Action, Santa Cruz County Bank, the City of Santa Cruz, Bay Federal Credit Union, Community Action Board, Temple Bethel, Second Harvest Food Bank, Peter Wang, the Housing Authority of Santa Cruz. New Way Homes, Housing Matters, Sutter Health, First Capital Bank, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers, Community Bridges, the Resource Center for Nonviolence, and UC Santa Cruz. Thanks to all of those sponsors. Um, I hardly need to explain why we're here. We're all familiar with the profound challenges of housing affordability and availability in Santa Cruz County. Tens of thousands of our neighbors and coworkers and friends and family members are faced with these challenges. And this problem is damaging the fabric of our community. While these challenges won't be met by local government alone, local governments have a central role in addressing them. Among other things, local governments review many specific housing proposals, make plans for siting of housing, provide funding, and create regulations and policies around housing development. So we've invited five local leaders, the vice chair of our county board of supervisors and the mayors of our four local cities to share the work of their governing bodies. Um, excuse me. Um, to share the work of their governing bodies, um, that the work they're doing to meet housing needs. So here's the format tonight. We'll have three minutes. It's um, not there. It's on my computer. Something okay. is set. We need a, a mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the, as I was saying, the format, each of the speakers will have the following opportunity. They'll have three minutes to offer some initial information on the work of the jurisdiction. Um, two minutes for a quick follow follow up question from me with a brief response, and then five minutes for um, for a couple of questions from Lookout reporter Chris Neely. So after one speaker finishes that cycle, then we'll move on to our next guest. Depending on time, we'll also try to ask some of the questions that you, the viewers, provide via the chat. Um, we'll see how the time goes. I'm going to be monitoring the time closely and will ask panelists to conclude comments when the time is up. Please note that we are keeping time. Finally, in terms of introduction, one informational note, there's two terms that most of our panelists are gonna to refer to in their comments. One is the acronym RHNA, RENA, RHNA, which stands for Regional Housing Needs Allocation. Each local community is required through a state and regional process to plan for the creation of a certain number of housing units within its boundaries. And these units must meet a variety of affordability levels. These allocation numbers are commonly referred to as RENA numbers. So you'll hear that. The other term I'm sure you'll hear is housing element. Every three years, eight, I mean, excuse me, every eight years, each community is mandated by state law to produce a housing plan to meet specific housing goals. This plan is incorporated into each community's general plan of overall community development and is called the housing element of the general plan. Okay, so with that introduction and ground rules, here we go. As I'm sure you all know, Justin Cummings is the county supervisor for the third district of Santa Cruz County, and he currently is serving as the vice chair of the board of supervisors. And without further ado, I welcome Supervisor Cummings. Thanks for being with us. Don, thanks for having me and for putting on this panel for Affordable Housing Month, which is such a critical thing that we need to address in our county. Um, I want to start by just um, really letting folks know about, you know, when we talk about, you know, county and, and the, the responsibilities of cities and when we talk about development, where we see a lot of the development occurring is largely within our cities. Those are considered the urban centers of our counties and where we see the most development occurring. So um, 
When we think about our rural areas, there's a lot of constraints in terms of development. So for example, when we think about um, areas of Bonnie Dune and areas within Boulder Creek, um, those are areas that don't have, for example, sewer systems and a lot of people are on septic and that constrains how much development we can occur that, that can occur within those areas versus cities where they have integrated wastewater management systems and sewer systems. And so when we see, when we think about development, we oftentimes see a lot of that happening within our urban cores. Uh, but that being said, as to what Dan, Don said earlier, you know, we are working on our housing element and the, the county of Santa Cruz is mandated to create um, roughly over 4,500 units um, of housing over the next 10 years. And so when we think about where those um, units are going to be produced, a lot of them will likely be within kind of the Live Oak area and in parts of the Aptos area where there are um, opportunities to connect into these, these sewer systems and in areas that fall within our ur urban service lines and our urban service areas. Um, and as it relates to affordable housing, I will say that we did just have one project that was completed and ap the application period just closed, but within Live Oak, there was an affordable housing project that produced 56 affordable units. And, um, and so as we're thinking about um, moving forward with affordable housing, um, we really need to start really focusing in on what are the needs within the community and where can we locate those units? Because um, while the very low and low affordable housing units are really critical to helping meet some of our needs around um, getting people off out of homelessness and into housing, we do also need to be thinking about the middle income people. So the people who are providing services within our community where we're seeing a lot of vacancies and programs uh, where we where we are desperately needing to get that kind of middle income housing. Um, the county has been seeing, and I know across the board, whether you're small business owners, schools, public safety, we're seeing high vacancy rates in those positions. And it's really difficult for us to recruit and retain uh, people who can carry out the services that really help our communities function. And, and so I think that as we're thinking about how we're developing within our housing element, that not only are we focusing on the housing for the very low and low income people, but we're also really critically focusing on the housing for our middle income folks who help um, you know, make sure that our water's running, that our kids are well-educated and that our communities are kept safe. And, um, and I will say that in terms of where the county is looking for some opportunities for whether it's workforce housing or affordable housing, we're starting to think about what land we have available. So are there opportunities for us to develop on Emmeline campus? Are there opportunities to develop at the county building in a parking lot where you know we just have surface lots and can we put housing there for our workforce? Um, these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about and I'm hoping that we can continue with the community to explore these moving forward. Great, thank you so much, Justin. So I'm gonna ask a quick one. I know it's a big one, but it's quick in asking at least. What about funding to help um, create a low, lower income housing? There doesn't seem to be a lot of local funding. Do you have some vision of how we might, um, at at the county level, create more? Um, that's a great question. I mean, having just been in the seat, I've been really focusing on um, the storms and helping fire survivors rebuild. Um, now we're now starting to move into those kinds of conversations, and um, you know, I think it's worth exploring you know, a variety of sources. I know that the city just had a vacancy tax that didn't pass, but, you know, I, I wonder if there's other opportunities for other tax measures we can consider. Um, I know that we have the opportunity to potentially move forward with the sales tax and whether a portion of that could go towards affordable housing. Um, and I know in the past there was a housing bond that was attempted that um, wasn't successful, but I think it's worth us coming together as a community and having those conversations around you know, what opportunities there are for us to explore and what people would get on board with in terms of us being able to create a revenue source that could um, put funding towards affordable housing. Great. Thanks so much, Justin. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris for five minutes for you guys to go back and forth a bit. Yeah. Hey, Justin. And I think some of these questions are opportunities for you to expand upon a little bit about what you talked about. Um, 
But the first question is, you know, the county has a lot of old housing and commercial stock. And, you know, the line I've also often heard is um, that there are few places to build. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff, but it's old and, and there's few available land, to, little available land to build. Do you, uh, do you agree with the notion that redevelopment is a key piece to the county fulfilling its arena obligations? And uh, if so, how do you encourage redevelopment uh, in a place that hasn't had much of it? I don't know. If, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so the conversation around redevelopment, you know, in terms of funds for redevelopment is something that um, for many conversations I've had with people over the years was blocked at the state level. And so in terms of the funding for redevelopment, that's not something that we really have access to at this point in time. Um, I would like to see us have a redevelopment agency statewide that we could um, lean into so that we could actually, um, you know, reinvest in a lot of the affordable housing and opportunities that there are. But I think at this point, really what we're trying to do um, is look at sites that we can either acquire uh, as a county to put more affordable housing on, or as I mentioned before, sites that are available for development that the county already has. And so, as I mentioned, there's a number of places where we're looking at trying to see how we can utilize um, current and existing land for the production of affordable housing. And that's just kind of the, the first step. But, you know, I think at this point, and as we're moving through the housing element, really looking at, you know, where are areas where we can increase density, especially those that lie along our, um, our transit corridors, uh, what are some opportunity sites that the county owns, or if there are sites that the county doesn't own, are there opportunities for working with those landowners um, or other folks in the county and organizations that where we could potentially acquire those sites and collaboratively build housing. So opportunities with the city, opportunities with UCSC or other organizations where we can really um, pool our resources and try to maximize the amount of uh, housing we can have that's for our workforce and for people who are low and very low income. Thanks. And um, and before I know you mentioned the housing bond, you know, the city of Santa Cruz is working on developing a housing bond. Um, what have the conversations been like at the county level as far as um, you asking taxpayers to maybe go out and, and vote for a bond to help the county reach uh, its arena numbers and, and the need for housing? Well, again, I mean, the city has been pushing that and the county actually had a housing bond measure that went out in 2018 and was unsuccessful. So that's not something that we've been reinvigorating yet. Um, the county is thinking about considering a sales tax measure uh, that would largely go towards helping us uh, sustain our services and um, really expand our workforce that we really need in terms of providing the services for people who are experiencing, whether it's homelessness or their low income, but making sure that we are able to uh, have an, a, a revenue source for um, for our workers in our county and so that they can actually afford to live here, right? Because if we have revenue for our workers um, and the ability to increase their salaries, then that will also help us as we're facing this affordability crisis. Um, but there is the opportunity for us to have conversations. And I think that as we consent, continue to consider what funding options out there and how they're gonna address our affordability crisis, doing polling to see what people will be comfortable with in terms of whether it's a bond measure or other types of tax measures, um, really trying to understand what the community wants to see in terms of how we can raise funding and help address our affordability crisis. Thanks, and um, I think we might have time for just one more. Um, yeah, real you know, quick. You touched on this. Yeah, you touched on this in your <laughs> comments uh, to start, but um, you know, obviously, aside from boosting housing supply to lower prices, you know, we've heard how the county is struggling to hire people. Um, how is the county thinking about workforce housing and, and housing specifically aimed at attracting county employees? You know, like what kind of partners does that require and what are the conversations like? Well, um, again, being really early into my career in the county, um, those conversations are kind of in their infancy, but I do think that there's opportunities for us to consider things like 
down payment assistance, um, looking at whether we can provide first last security or a variety of types of um, options around rental assistance, just so that there's incentives for people to come here. And when people are struggling to find housing, that we can actually get them in housing, get them stable while they're trying to find other options. And, um, and my hope is that we can actually work with other housing partners, that we can work with um, other jurisdictions in terms of what types of housing are getting built and how we can stabilize people as they're coming to provide services and work for the county. But um, I'm really hoping to work with the community and kind of hear about what um, opportunities there are that people think would be worth us investing in so that we can really move towards um, making sure that we have a stable community. And while some of that is construction of more housing, a, a, a part of that is also being able to just provide the people with the resources that they need so they can get into some form of housing, get stable, and then we can help them as they can transition into more permanent housing. Great. Thanks, Justin, so much. Um, appreciate it so much. Um, next, because we got to keep moving. Um, we have a lot, a lot of folks to visit with. Um, Eduardo Montesino is a longtime city council member in the city of Watsonville, as, is currently serving as the city's mayor. We're so glad to have Eduardo with us. Welcome, Eduardo. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. I don't know if you got my presentation, um, but if you didn't, I, I, like I said, I could just uh, definitely just talk about it. You know, um, uh, one of the things in our in our community, just to get right to it, um, is our our populations of census in in twenty uh, in twenty twenty one the medium household income was um sixty uh, six, sixty seven thousand and um our population is fifty two thousand um uh, around and our Latino um population is eighty four point three percent um and but our thirty percent of that population is under the age of eighteen um our <clears throat> Persons over 65 age uh, of age is are 65, and you know our housing stock. Uh, to talk about our 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 housing uh, is the total total dwelling is 14,699. That's total housing within our our community. Um, our single um, family housing is 9,098. Our senior housing is 1,124. <clears throat> and our mobile home um, park uh, community is 1,106. Um, our affordable housing ordinance, uh, our first ordinance was in 91, um, and our current ordinance was adopted in 2001 um, that set standards for rental and home ownership re uh, that require percentages and, and set Watsonville income limits. Um, but we also, you know, uh, put in um, a set in lieu fees and incentive for, for our community. Um, we're uh, tackling our housing needs in different priorities. Um, it, or no, although we count as South County as a uh, as uh, just past Optus, actually the city of Watson has a lot of restraints. A lot. Uh, uh, we just had you know a ballot measure not too long ago where we wanted to extend our our urban line, but the voters decided not to. So our constraints are really compacted um but we're still dealing with um you know our 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 cultural lands and our needs and and our infrastructure that we need but we have you know 48 units um uh, on airport uh, that are being built uh we have pippin 2 along you know in back at freedom boulevard we have 53 units on freedom boulevard just um uh, on freedom boulevard um, another 21 on units on airport land. Um, we have 72 um, units that are uh, put uh, that are, are that are um, due to be built on Miles Lane. Um, we have 16 units on, you know, um, a townhouse on Marin Street, and we're 
uh, in the back of target area, we have um, uh, 144 units that we just broke ground on, which are called Hillcrest. And there's another development back in that area with 87 units and um, 50 units on 50, uh, 558 on Main Street. So um, we're doing, you know, uh, a lot of development. And our housing policies are um, that we're that we're trying to uh, we try to help uh, around city limits is we have a low interest lo loan to nonprofit developers, down payment assistance programs for FTHB, rental assistance for homeowners, landlord incentives program, house and rehab ADU program, um, and what we're working on, which is uh, this is the big. Uh, topic that I want to talk to you about um, is the downtown Pacific plan that you know that that we're in either the it's been going on for a few years but it's going to gather us hopefully at 4,000 units just in the downtown. Um, Eduardo I'm going to pa pause you and because yeah. your three minutes is finished but I'm going to fall I'm going to give you a chance in a way to finish yeah. that just could because you were led right into it what are what what's it going to take to get to 4000 units in da, in the downtown i mean what how's that going to is that really going to happen how do you feel about the reality of that the reality of it i just i just I actually uh, talked to our our, our uh, uh, housing staff um, that there's already interest in that in that component because there's a lot of interest. You know, one of the things that that gather us um, a lot of interest in our community is working with Caltrans because you know it's we're in a highway on Main Street, you know, and working together finally with Caltrans, we're been able to develop you know in a community base, you know, gathering uh, you know advocates community, you know, uh, developers. Um, so there's a lot of interest in a, a being able to uh, um, provide, you know, in the downtown uh, development, uh, you know, um, some expectation that, the, that we're able to uh, build all those units. Great. Thank you. And Chris, over to you. Yeah, and thanks, Eduardo. Um, that's pretty big news about the downtown um, development plan. Um, you know, through RENA, I think, one of the big things with furthering, uh, a, a, you know, affordable housing is that um, a lot, all the affordable units can't be located in one area. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, where do you expect to see affordable units go in uh, Watsonville aside from downtown um, to help, re uh, help the city reach the reach arena goals? Well, you know, uh, like, uh, like I, I wish I could have, uh, she, uh, you could have seen my presentation, but because I provided a uh, a map of all the areas around around the community that that we're developing and where there's you know variety of uh, of um, housing, uh, not only you know and focusing on one area, but focusing around all the community from freedom. Freedom is our, you know, one of my main corridors, but Main Street, um, so it encompasses, you know, all the main corridors where there's transit, um, and you know, um, Metro just announced, you know, that they got, you know, eight million, um, uh, you know, dollars to redevelop their Watsonville Transit Center. So that's another opportunity for workforce housing. So we're looking at all the areas, and not not just designated just one area in the downtown. Thanks. Um, and I know this week city council discussed the possibility of uh, maybe focusing some of its efforts on building housing specifically for teachers. Um, how does workforce specific housing fit into Watsonville's plans with all this uh, development going on? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, uh, it's an exception, but we're uh, we're going to try to, uh, uh, you know, have conversations with our school district, which is our one of our biggest partner, and Cabrillo College in, in the downtown area. There's potential sites around the downtown where the, that we can garner opportunities um, because, you know, it's greatly needed to be able to attract the talent that we need in the future and to be able to keep the existing talent that we, that we have in our in our community because we're all challenged and and and, and keeping our employees and also the fostering uh, you know uh, to get new employees in the community thanks um and you know do you and it sounds like the you know this big downtown uh development plan uh it's a long-term plan but 
uh, just kind of focusing on these next eight years, I mean, do you expect a lot of the progress to be made in these kind of larger multifamily developments, such as the new transit center, or um, do you expect there to be some development within neighborhoods as well? Well, uh, we, uh, you know, as the city grows, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're uh, hoping to expand not just on the downtown, but freedom is a great corridor to, uh, uh, to have Media conversation um, because it's a transit corridor. Because um, uh, we're uh, we're trying to do transitions, although it's hard with pains for our community because we have too many cars. I think, in in my view, in our community, um, so we uh, we gotta uh, we gotta get uh, you know uh, towards that boat. But um, we're uh, we're looking at every every possibility because we're we're constraining in in our our boundaries. So we're looking at uh, all possibilities around the community, uh, around redevelopment areas like Pippin Two, which is back um, in back of Freedom. We're you know developing in in right in on Freedom Boulevard. We're developing on you know on Main Street. Um, so any possibilities of housing for our community, we're uh, we're looking at it at every stage and at every level. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and we'll turn it back to Don. Thank you so much, um, Eduardo, and thanks, Chris. So um, pretty recently, a conflict <laughs> showed up in the scheduling for Santa Cruz Mayor Fred Keeley and prevented him from joining us. However, we are so fortunate that City Council member and former mayor of Santa Cruz, Sonia Bruner, is able to join us to represent the city of Santa Cruz tonight. Welcome, Council Member Bruner. Thank you so much, Don. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, well, happy Affordable Housing Month. I'm really happy to be here this evening. Um, Sonia Brenner, current City of Santa Cruz Council member, and uh, Mayor Keeley is attending a community meeting with uh, regarding the potential workforce affordable housing bond. Uh, that was mentioned earlier. So I'll be preventing, uh, I'll start with kind of going over the current work the city of Santa Cruz is doing um, to meet affordable housing needs in our community. And, and I think I'll like to start with um, kind of funding and uh, the way that the city has been supporting affordable housing initiatives um, through uh, different programs. So there's a permit and impact fee coverage. So when um, there's funding available, uh, there's a program that covers uh, the permit impact fees for affordable housing and workforce housing projects. And it can range from a few thousand dollars to a million, depending on the project size, from what I understand. There's also emergency rental assistance and security deposit programs. And that is in partnership with Community Action Board um, and provides funding for eviction prevention uh, services, direct rental assistance, um, and housing authority to assist with low-income households with security deposits. Um, there's also when uh, funding's available. Um, the city can also consider support with nonprofit developers who build affordable housing with uh, gap financing. And recent requests came from school district, housing authority, housing matters, um, uh, developers with bigger projects that 20% or more is affordable housing. Um, and also there's various projects. The Coral Street Visioning Study has just begun. There's an affordable workforce housing project, um, Highway 1 and 9. Uh, city has purchased 125 Coral Street for permanent supportive housing. And there's also part of the navigation center uh, area there over by Costco and across from the Tannery Arts Center. Um, there's uh, the city also provided a loan to 
uh, an affordable housing developer for the old outdoor world site in, on River Street. And um, hopefully that will be developed to be an affordable workforce housing project. And there's also currently exploration for uh, additional housing projects uh, on some city-owned parking lots. We also met our fifth uh, cycle RENA goals and we're now working on our sixth um, cycle. There's a, the city has a housing element subcommittee and we just submitted our draft to the State Department of Housing and Community Development last week. Um, we included an array of policies um, protecting existing renters, preserving existing affordable housing, promoting housing production in areas of high uh, opportunity. And some of those sites have been identified. Um, really, there's uh, there was a, a affordable housing month event a couple weeks ago, and um, the speaker spoke about the three S's, supply, stability, and subsidy. And I, the city is working really hard um, on all three of those. Thanks, um, Sonia. I, I need to. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. So just a quick question, because I don't have a lot. I only get I only have about a minute here now. Um, could you just say a little bit more about what the city is exploring that the mayor is at, what, what's happening there in terms of a revenue uh, measure, just so people yes. have the latest? Yes, so there's a um, proposed potential workforce affordable housing bond being explored for uh, next year's ballot. And um, at our last council meeting, we voted to um, approve funding for a polling survey to be done with voters. And so um, that's a randomized survey with a, a third party um, firm that will do that. So you might be someone who receives a call asking you questions about that. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Sonia. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris for a couple, couple of questions with you. Yeah, thanks and hi, Sonia. Um, yeah, so Santa Cruz is somewhat in an enviable position when it comes to ARENA, having been the, being the only jurisdiction locally to fulfill the fifth cycle requirements while also already having more than doubled the capacity for the sixth cycle. Um, and you guys have already approved the first draft of your housing element. Um, but in that in that approved first draft of the city's housing element, the city relies pretty heavily on UC Santa Cruz's uh, student housing west development in order to fulfill the city's obligations for low and very low income units. Um, is that reasonable? And how can the city really rely on the university to build more uh, than half of the city's required low income restricted units? So I, I'm not sure where you're getting your information. Um, I know that some of the university's housing does not qualify for our arena numbers. There's criteria of a lot of people here um, probably already know, but you know, if it's a room with a kitchenette or certain um, features don't exist, then it wouldn't qualify for our arena numbers. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity we're exploring in all areas, not just the university. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about how the university can be a partner uh, or how the city views the university as a partner in uh, building affordable housing? Yes, uh, so, you know, we've, um, I know the mayor especially recently has had conversations with the university and the chancellor, the regents, um, the long range development plan and really working to encourage and support the university for building more on campus housing. And um, there have been discussions about uh, the university building off campus housing. And I know conversations have happened to really encourage new housing versus taking over existing housing. We want to increase um, uh, the supply and not 
uh, takeover supply. And I guess there was an example with a, an apartment uh, that the regents uh, purchased and it, existing community members living there um, were given a couple of options of whether to move or stay. And so it wasn't adding any additional units. So we're really encouraging, you know, affordable housing for the students and new housing that the university provide new housing for the students at affordable rates. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I'm seeing in the comments too, this is news to me even, um, that the UCSC low income units were removed from the draft um, submitted to the state. Um, so yeah, so that happened uh, after city council approval. Um, so the second question is homelessness is of course top issue in Santa Cruz and uh, permanent supportive housing seems to be the tool the city needs the most of. So, um, you know, the, right now the mayor, like we said, is uh, at a event starting to shape this uh, 2024 bond. Um, considering uh, permanent supportive housing um, in comparison is the one that Santa Cruz has struggled to build. Um, what level do you think the bond should focus on fu funding for uh, permanent supportive housing versus other housing types? Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of exploration into that question. And I think there's a lot of input that is being sought right now um, and data that we need to understand. I can speak to, um, uh, you know, currently what's coming is uh, in various projects about, uh, I think in the current pipeline, there's uh, 230 permanent supportive unit, housing units and um, uh, 50 of them uh, downtown and, um, you know, housing matters as well. So I know that we've been really working to um, identify what exactly uh, the different types of housing needs are in terms of transitional housing, emergency housing, permanent supportive housing, um, the very low housing. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'll turn it back to Don as well. Thank you. Perfect timing. <laughs> All right, we're roll, rolling along. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, next, um, it's our pleasure to welcome Jack Dillis, who is another um, longtime city council member, this time in the city of Scotts Valley, and he is currently serving as the mayor of that fi fine city in the mountains. Welcome, Jack. And don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, thanks for having us here. This is great, a chance to talk about housing, which is about, I spent a lot of time talking about housing. So I'll talk about, in Scotts Valley, um, status of our housing element, um, RENA challenges, and our current strategies. Tomorrow, we're going to release our first draft of our draft, uh, our draft housing element. Um, and so we'll have a 30-day period for the public to comment. And in the middle of those 30 days, of course, we'll have another public workshop uh, to talk about that with the public. And then we'll meet again our Council and Planning Commission, and then we'll send our first draft off to the state, and then we'll have our back and forth. And hopefully we can work all that out. Challenges are that we're a small place. We have 4.6 miles. We have a lot of slopes and, and hillsides. And so it's a challenge for us to put, in our case, 1,220 new homes um, into a, a town. Currently, we have 4,600 homes. and But it's really more than 1,220 because 800 of those need to be affordable units. So in reality, to get 800 affordable units, uh, unless we can find nonprofit developers, the market's gonna, we're, we're going to have to do a lot more than 800. We've kicked around numbers like 3,000, but I'm hearing that uh, the, the draft they see tomorrow may be pushing that number down, which I'm, I hope it does, even though we need, we need housing. Um, challenges, uh, also we have community expectations. A lot of folks here love having a small town, so we're gonna try and keep it small, but, but they, it's a, a conversation to have, and, and we're having those conversations. Um, infrastructure needs, people ask me about water, about traffic, um, and so forth. So uh, those are challenges we have to work on. And uh, I know the push to get housing, but we obviously need to have all the support structure to go along with that. 
rezoning. Our current capacity uh, in our current zoning is only 334. So 1,200 plus is, is, a, is a jump. So we're clearly going to have to do rezoning and funding. It sounds like we can talk about funding in a little bit. Um, strategies. We have uh, pipeline projects, 334 units going through right now. Uh, ADUs, the state will allow us to put 20 units in there for eight years uh, based upon history. We really want to make our future town center a centerpiece for housing. So while we have 250 uh, that are supposed to be built there more, we think we're going to push for more. Uh, we have underutilized residential. We want to increase the density. We want to focus big time on commercial property, especially along Scotts Valley Drive, underutilized properties. We could be more efficient with our business uh, business locations. And we want to increase the portion of commercial um, service commercial construction has can have no more than 50% residential there. We want to push that up to maybe something like 70% to, again, incentivize construction of more homes. Industrial, we kind of want to leave that alone. There's a little bit, but we want to protect our economic base and our jobs. And then we have some other things like uh, public, uh, quasi-public properties that, that aren't developed that we have see a couple of large ones there we have uh, potential and we're out there talking with all the owners developers and saying even when we just approved we're back talking with the developer and saying hey would you put more homes on there uh, we need more homes so the conversation is is changing rapidly and uh, we're encouraged that we're going to be able to do this great thank you so much jack so my quick question and i'm going to show my hand a little bit i know because of my past history with the city of Santa Cruz, that a piece of land that the city of Santa Cruz used to own is now in, is in the city of Scotts Valley, the Sky Park area. And some housing has been built there, but not as much as there could be, I suppose. So where what's gonna, what's holding that up? What what do you think is the potential for really moving something significant that there in that site? Well, we've been trying for at least 30 years uh, to develop our town center. And if the vision has changed. Our 2008 specific plan was all about 300,000 square feet of commercial retail and 300 homes. The, we've kind of hung on to the 300 homes concept, but the, the amount of, of commercial retail isn't going to happen with the, with the, the way things have evolved. Um, the 300 homes are supposedly over a much bigger area than the actual, most people think of the uh, the, the core there next to the Kings Village Shopping Center as being where town center is going to go, and it is. But the specific plan is actually a much larger area than that. Um, so we do own some of the land, some of it we bought with affordable housing money. Therefore, we're required to use that property to build affordable housing. And we're, uh, we'd like to get that property from, this, from the city of Santa Cruz. We've had conversations uh, uh, off and on. At one time, we had a developer lined up a few years ago that went into escrow with the city of Santa Cruz to buy the land. Uh, was working with the city. They had a uh, uh, an agreement that they could they could uh, start you know start the conversation to develop. But then they they backed out of it. I think part of that was because there were the toxics in the land were unknown. A lot of work's been done to identify the the fact that those issues are resolved. How much is there, and therefore we think it's going to be easier to develop. So we have been having those conversations with Santa Cruz. Uh, as one councilman, I know I, I would love to see. Uh, us acquire the land from Santa Cruz and be able, it's right next to the city's land. So it would be a, an ideal uh, site. And the, the thing, if we could control that land, perhaps if we can afford it, we could either donate or sell at a discount some of that land to, uh, to a nonprofit developer. They could combine that with tax credits and build all affordable buildings um, at a discount, meaning less than it would be uh, otherwise. So that would just be some of the development but, um, but we're encouraged that we might be able to get that land from Santa Cruz at some point. And so we're looking seriously at that in terms of our housing element. I'll see what's in our housing element when, uh, when we look at it tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Jack. So over to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks. And hi, Jack. Um, yeah, so uh, just looking at the, and it sounds like you guys have some pipeline projects as well, but um, the progress report from 2022 showed that the city had only permitted about 20 of the obligated 82 uh, very low to moderate income units. Um, the state wants the city to permit 803 of these units by uh, 2031, a uh, pretty significant increase. Um, so the pace of permitting is going to have to change in Scotts Valley uh, if it's going to hit its six arena or six cycle arena numbers. 
Um, do you foresee major cosmetic changes to Scotts Valley? I know you talked about how it's a small town and uh, people want to keep it that way, but this is a pretty big uh, injection of units that the state's asking for. Uh, yes. So we're trying to have all the conversations we need to have. Uh, it will be a significant change. We're hoping that we can find a way to fit it nicely into town. Uh, and I like to think that some of the larger developments wouldn't get too tall. Uh, we don't have tall buildings in Scotts Valley. So I'm hoping we can keep, keep something uh, to just a few stories, but just spread it out a lot more, particularly along Scotts Valley Drive um, and in the, uh, the town center we talked about and a couple other locations off of Mount Hermon Road. So I believe it's possible to do that. Um, and uh, we're going to do everything we can. And uh, just uh, so time will tell, but you're right, it's a big challenge. And uh, it's, uh, it's hard to get my head around how we could do that. But we're, we're, we're working on a plan. So we're going to come up with a plan. And then, uh, and the plan, of course, has to be in the state's words, feasible. So we can't just say we're going to build housing here or here, we have to show that in fact, there's good reasons to think that it is going to happen. Uh, maybe not the exact timing, but that we have property owner support to do that, and uh, and that we have the the right setup, and we followed all the all the all the things that the state wants us to to put in there, and, and we're trying to do that. We expect some surprises along the way, and we know that if something doesn't happen, we have to substitute something else in there to to stay within that. Um, you're right. The big challenge is the 800 affordable units, um, and we did. We have one. Near City Hall, we actually built just about 50 units back in the 90s, uh, all affordable. Half of them were very low and half were affordable. So, I mean, half were very low and half were low. So uh, we have some history being able to produce at least that many. So uh, we're encouraged by that. Great. And, um, you know, Don, I would, I would love to turn it over to audience questions. We, I think we have about seven minutes left unless I have time for one more. Now, go ahead and do ask Jack one more. Sure. Um, yeah, Jack, so I was watching a you know, city council meeting from a few months ago, and I thought it was interesting, the conversation along Scotts Valley Drive and how uh, people were really concerned about the zoning there that required mixed use, um, whereas a lot of places are, are looking for mixed use opportunities to finance the housing. It seemed like Scotts Valley was worried about being able to attract commercial in order to actually build housing in these mixed use zones. Uh, can you talk about that challenge a little bit? Uh, sure. Well, just a little bit of history. The concept in Scotts Valley way back was that we would have commercial right along the street. And we've done that for the most part along Scotts Valley Drive. And behind those are housing developments. So if you get off of Scotts Valley Drive, you'll see typically you might see a little bit of, of commercial behind the, that first level, that first uh, uh, area of, of houses, I mean, of businesses, but it's all housing behind that for the most part, except for an industrial section on one side. Um, so that the history was we wanted commercial there to get the you know the sales dollars and folks the sales uh, tax, um, and now we're thinking mixed use is a good thing. Uh, we want to keep that element of commercial, but we also want to have a lot of housing. And so to, to us, it works to have uh, the mixed use, and we want to encourage the mixed use. It's been possible, but some of the developers have said, well, fifty percent housing wasn't enough. I think I heard that the county say that as well in, in one of the forums I was in. Um, at any rate, so we're going to uh, to. I, it looks like we're, I'll see what's in the in the housing element tomorrow of the draft. But it looks like we're going to increase that. Want to increase that percentage to something that will attract more housing, and give us some commercial at the same time. All right. Great. Thanks. Jack. Yeah, I'll turn it back to Don. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, so next, uh, <laughs> I have a little apology here. Um, Due to a scheduling error on my part, um, Capitola Mayor Margot Kaiser wasn't able to join us live tonight. However, we made arrangements with Margot and um, she was kind enough to meet with us beforehand and record both a presentation and a little Q&A with us. So welcome Margot via video from a few days ago. <laughs> Oh. 
Well, we're going to try to fix the sound on this. Thanks so much. Um, I'm also here with our um, community development director, Katie Herlihy. Hi. Um, so recently, um, what Capitola has been going through is uh, processing what our um, new RENA numbers represent for us, which last uh, cycle, which was the fifth cycle of our RENA numbers, we had a requirement of about 140 units. Um, and this cycle has turned around um, to about nine times that. So we have been working closely um, with well, Katie's been working closely with a consultant so that we have been able to try to identify some places of, of opportunity to that might present us with a way to create more affordable housing within our city limits. Uh, and if anybody's been to Capitola, they know that it's, it's pretty on top of each other. So this task uh, has been pretty daunting. Uh, we were able to meet uh, both the planning commission and Capitola city council met in conjunction uh, and looked over maps and looked over sites that have been sort of dog-eared for these options. And um, we have tried to insert about a 1,600 unit buffer. So it's about like a 20% buffer because you can present these things and they may come back to you with other ideas or things that they don't like. And we want to make sure we really hit the numbers so that there are no other issues that would come our way because of not <laughs> being compliant. And uh, yeah, so we did actually just, um, well, the planning commission did just approve a affordable housing uh, unit, which is going to be on Capitola Road. So there's going to be 35 units within that space, uh, in, which includes one employee unit. And uh, so that is looking up for us as a way of moving forward with these meeting these goals and uh we are having a community meeting so this will kind of go over more of what is being finalized uh that's on may 16th and that's at six mm -hmm. and then the planning commission meeting is on june 1st and all of these are public so any members of the public are able to attend uh, whether they want to do Zoom or or in public as well. And um, everything is also going to be available on our website as well as within um, the City Hall. So I know people have a lot of questions and there's a lot of uh, things that are sort of undetermined right now. So if you are wanting to buff up on that, then definitely check out what we've done so far as a way to sort of get in line with these new numbers that are being put on us. And Katie, did you want to add any specifics to that? Sure. Um, I'll just add that uh, May 10th is the date that once this is published, it will it will have been published, our housing element. Um, and so the 30-day review period starts. So we're really hoping to get uh, community engagement in that process. And as uh, the mayor walked through, we've got different um, community meetings coming up, a six, May 16th, and then a planning commission June 1st, and city council on June 8th. So really hoping to get public comment, and letters submitted, and emails. Um, but thanks. I think you covered it, though. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for that good outline of what's happening right now. So, um, Mayor Kaiser, could you tell us a little bit about how Capitola sees um, there being some funding for the afford most affordable units that might be built in the city of Capitola? I know that's always one of the biggest challenges is having some kind of funding source that underwrites the cost of affordable units. And what, what do you have? lined up for that or what are you considering yes we do have a fund um it's it's a, a housing trust funds so we ha have a little bit over one hundred and forty thousand dollars in that fund um and this is where this is how we kind of save up uh 
for square footage for every new home, there's um, a $25 fee for um, the builder. And then um, we did just go over the 15% the is, um, sorry, for every seven units built, one unit, that's our 15%, um, has to be allocated for affordable housing. And um, then we've also, we have, um, there's a, the PLHA, uh, is a funding, it's a funding grant. So we are part of that as well. Um, and we've also done some other programs um, with uh, like affordable housing projects. We want to try to work more with developers that are going to be utilizing those funds, uh, making it a little bit more possible uh, for, uh, well, landlord incentive is big too. So trying to use those funds and making it easy for people to be landlords for section eight and things like that. And um, just incentivize, incentivize some of the builders to actually get on board with some new projects that will lead us in the direction of better housing numbers. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, Chris, what would you like to ask? Yeah, thanks. Um, and it was just updating some of the notes with that. So with the news of that 35, is it a 35 unit um, fully affordable development? It is. <laughs> it's uh, 35 units that are 100% uh, affordable units, and then one is an employee housing unit. Great. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, so I just have three questions. Um, so, uh, and I was using the 2022 progress report as a metric uh, in developing these questions. So um, just using that metric, uh, it looks like Capitola's affordable housing strategy has had some trouble over the last eight years as it, uh, you know, as of 2022 or end of 2022 only permitted seven of 57 uh, very low to low income units and three of 26 moderate income units. Um, I guess with that new 35 unit um, development, it'll be a total of 45 out of 83 um, mandated uh, very low to moderate uh, income units. Um, if Capitola is going to hit its affordable housing goals for very low to moderate income units for the sixth cycle, it'll need to increase its affordable housing permitting by uh, almost 2,000%. Um, that increase is not only difficult to fathom, but for a place as small as Capitola, makes one think that the look of Capitola, as we know, it will need to change uh, in order to achieve those numbers. So. Uh, Mayor Kaiser, um, if you could please explain why you are or are not confident that Capitola will successfully permit the 1,300 units called for by the state by 2031. Thank you for the question. So yeah, going through this process, what I've learned is us as the city, what we're really trying to do here is just identify spaces that would become, could potentially become available to developers or anything like that. So everything comes to either planning commission or if it gets to as far as city council, uh, when things are being approved, that's how we work really hard together to make sure we're staying in line with the way we want to see Capitola viewed and progress. We have to progress no matter what. This is what these numbers are telling us. However, we do want to preserve some of our pointness, some of our idyllic sort of situations that we have here. So yes, it is it is concerning. And these numbers, you sort of have these sticker shock reactions. But uh, I think if we're all working together, if we get good developers in here who want to work in conjunction with our planning commission and with city council, then we will be headed in the right direction to get what we need done. And would you say that you're confident that uh, Capitola could permit 1,300 units by 2031? That probably is a better question for Katie. I'm not a huge, <laughs> uh, I don't do it a ton with the permitting, so <laughs> Katie would probably know more than I. So yes, if, um, if developers came in and they, they had the ability to redevelop their sites, we definitely know that there's enough space in Capitola. We, updated our zoning over the last cycle and did all a whole new zoning map, all new zoning, mixed use is allowed in all of our 
uh, commercial and mixed use areas now. So there's definitely the potential for it. And we would definitely staff up if we got enough development in, we'd have enough plan checkers and reviewers to make sure it was done within the cycle. But the biggest challenge is, you know, uh, as the mayor said, like we we don't we have limited funding. So our ability to really contribute beyond development rights is is lacking. So it's really great to know that the state has come up with these PLHA funds, but still that's six hundred thousand dollars of funds over five years that's not gonna assist very many units. So um, that's the struggle is you don't have the funding to do it. So we really, um, um, we're dependent on the developers coming in to redevelop their sites. We have about one minute left, so just. Okay, great. Um, all right, so without uh, progress on permitting, the state mandated units, uh, Capitola could lose some local discretionary control over products that offer affordable housing. Um, in what ways does Capitola need a change to accommodate Arena, and do you think that the community could maintain its identity um, amid such an increase in affordable housing? Well, I think um, it it's really all about community, right? And that's sort of why our community development, <laughs> development team is here and why I'm part of the city council at this point. And um, we will work to do what we have to do in order to increase the affordability of housing. We want this to be an equitable city and hopefully with other projects um, coming down the line with possibly more development of more jobs and things like that to really bring people to Capitola and make make living here a possibility for them. And um, that's that's sort of where our, our heads are at. Okay, in, abs in absentia, I want to thank Mayor Kaiser. And I also want to just quickly say, I, I we we did have a technical challenge, and I want to apologize to Mayor Montesino. For, he had a some slides he was going to show, and we we weren't able to get those up for him. And I do apologize for that. But thanks for per plugging ahead without that without that, Eduardo. Um, we really are getting close to the end of time. The only question that I had seen as of a few minutes ago, um, the the one the one question that was is worth I'll try and reframe it a little bit. It was about um, would what about a real estate transfer tax as a funding source for affordable housing? So I wonder if each of you could just take one minute to comment on why that would be an appropriate funding source or not, um, just from your perspective. And why don't we start with Mayor Dillis. Yes, I know a little bit about uh, tra uh, transfer taxes uh, as a former city finance director. And uh, when I worked for a what's called a general law city, as opposed to a, a charter city, Santa Cruz is a charter city, uh, Morgan Hill was and Scotts Valley are uh, um, general law cities. General law cities cannot, as I understand it, adopt any kind of a transfer tax. The existing transfer tax is collected when a ho house is sold uh, in Scotts Valley, half of the money goes to the city of Scotts Valley and half goes to the county. If we became a charter city like Santa Cruz, my understanding is we could adopt our own transfer tax and keep that money and use it for whatever the purposes might be. However, we would give up the half that we're currently getting. So right now there's a, I think it's a dollar, I'm trying to remember, a dollar 10 per thousand dollars of valuation or something. That tax would all go to the county and we would lose our half, but we could implement a new tax and keep all of that. So uh, my understanding is there, that's that wrinkle that would cut out general law cities like Scotts Valley. We could we could become a charter city, but that would take us a while. How about um, Supervisor Cummings? What's your thought on that? Great, thanks. Um, you know, I think that uh, to Mayor Dillis's point, um, understanding what general law counties versus um, charter counties and same thing with general law versus uh, charter cities can do is really important when considering this because I do know that San Jose passed a real estate transfer tax and it's actually been doing 
uh, really good with helping them provide funding for very low, moderate, very low income housing, moderate income housing, and housing for people experiencing homelessness. So there is an opportunity there. Um, and, you know, those types of taxes can be set at certain properties over a specific value. So if it's any property over $2 million um, is subject to a real estate transfer tax or 3 million or even, you know, 1 million, we can go, you know, we can determine what that would be. And that would probably need to go to go to the people. Um, but understanding how it can get implemented under the various different systems of government is probably critical for making sure that we can make it work in our county. And then it would just be up to the will of the people if this is something that they'd be willing to um, to see us move forward. Um, Mayor Montesino. Yeah, I'd be willing to have that conversation because, you know, the housing, you know, needs in our community, especially for workforce housing or even attractability um, housing um, is needed. Um, but we do need to get, a, a, you know, a conversation going on this on, on this issue. If we're willing to go um, uh, to the community because, yeah, we have general cities, you know, ours in Watson was a charter city, how, how you know, the, the, all those components in the county. Um, but it's a conversation to have in, in around the community. Um, it's in a, a at a point that it's a, we need to have that conversation because you know the the housing need where uh, a lot of people are being pushed out because you know um, uh, the affordability of it. So um, yeah, I'm willing to talk about it. Great. Um, I I'm not sure if uh, we've lost um, Councilmember Bruner. Are you still with us? To respond, I guess it looks like not. Okay, well, thank you for that question from from one of our viewers. Um, our time is really, I wish we had more time, but we did tell our panelists that we'd end about um, 8.15 and we're rapidly approaching that. Um, I do again wanna thank Chris um, and all of the panelists for taking the time to join us this evening um, and thanks especially to Lookout and all our sponsors. Um, as we close, it's my pleasure to introduce um, the very talented executive director of the organization I'm with, Housing Santa Cruz County, that's Elaine Johnson. Elaine has been burning the midnight oil this month as our organization put together a whole bunch of different community events as part of a affordable housing month. And thank you, Elaine, and please take us home. Thank you, Don. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, Don, thank you and our partners from Lookout for putting on this very informative event this evening. You know, as we celebrate Affordable Housing Month for May, you know, I'm just in awe. This is my first Affordable Housing Month and I'm just in awe of all of the, 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 the community that has come together, our community partners to make these events, you know, not just informative, but, but an, an opportunity to invite each of you to, to step on in and to lean in and to join these conversations and see where you see yourself and being supportive and, and, and working with our local jurisdictions to see how we can help support them in meeting these reading numbers. Because we know, you know, I've been, I was at a couple of meetings earlier today and there's this word that keeps coming up is daunting. And we, as we know, these numbers may be high. I think you know, as the community and as strong as this community is, if we, um, you know, work together, um, I, you know, I think that um, God only knows what we can do, right? So I, I thank everybody for showing up this evening. And I also want to invite you, if you're not already, to join Housing Santa Cruz County. I actually just put, I'm going to hit this enter button. The web, our website link is in the chat. You know, click on that, you know, sign up for our newsletter, get on our email list. Um, we'd love to have you join us and do this advocacy work that we're doing, you know, because each and every one of us, we, we, we're all impacted by housing, whether it's ourselves personally or someone we know. And so I know we're all striving for the same thing, to bring more affordable housing here to Santa Cruz County. And so um, I invite you to join us, you know, as as you know, there's different jurisdictions are, are working on their final drafts of the arena numbers. 
you know, we're going to see how we can partner with, with, with them as Housing Santa Cruz County as a whole and, and to work in and see how we can um, help support them in this journey these next eight years. So I invite you to join us. Uh, again, thank you, Don, for putting us on and Chris and our additional um, lookout partners. And um, I wish everybody a great evening. And, and what you'll also see on our website, you can also click there's, we have a couple more weeks left in May. We have two groundbreakings happening this month, which is very exciting, very, very exciting. And you'll get to see that there's homes that are being built. And for me, and I invite you, let, let, let that be that, that, that breath of air to say that, okay, we can do this. And so we look forward to seeing you throughout, throughout the county this month and beyond, because this is just the beginning. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.